Hey guys, welcome back to lecture number 12, Nationalism and the People's War. Part of the legacy of the French Revolution was the development of two novel phenomena, nationalism and the modern way of warfare, the doctrine of nationalism for every nation and state, for every state and nation. Developed along with modern republicanism, the Napoleonic Wars following the French Revolution intensified nationalism in France and in conquered lands and initiated the first modern war. The great military theorist Karl von Clausewitz recognized that Napoleon changed war forever. In this lecture, we will examine the meaning of these two great changes. Defining Nationalism Nationalism is a modern phenomenon. It's true that humans have always lived in groups that shared a common cultural, religion, ethnicity, or race, but those were not states. They were predominantly local kin-based associations, perhaps with a dialectic of a language spreading over a number of villages a short distance from one another. The great agrarian empires, such as Rome, regarded subjects of vastly different ethnic and cultural heritage to be equally subject to aristocratic and central authority. The legitimacy of the king or aristocracy had nothing to do with the language they spoke. Nationalism means a sovereign state that itself represents one culture or ethnic group over a large area and the belief that this ethnic group of people ought to be self-ruling. Using Ernest Gellner's definition of nationalism means to each people a state, to each stage one people. People have the right to self-rule, that doesn't mean democracy, but that government, to be legitimate, must share and express the culture of the people. Nationalism is historically connected with national self-rule. To say, for example, that it is wrong for Algeri uh, Algerians to be ruled or colonized by the French because Algerians should be themselves should rule themselves is nationalist. In fact, at the end of World War I, when Woodrow Wilson insisted on breaking up colonial empires, he was being a democratic nationalist. The two can easily go together. In feudal society, an aristocratic French speaker had far more in common with an aristocratic German speaker than with a French peasant. To become nationalistic is to say that the French aristocrat and the French peasant share something in common that is much more important than their differences, their Frenchness. Nationalism promotes international e equality rather than international equality. Notice also that nationalism goes along with centralized rule in the modern state or nation state. It requires literacy and widespread education because the people over a large region must know that they share history and probably a literature. Nationalism with a centralized government provides an open trading environment with common laws and a common language and is thus good for business. Emergence of nationalism in Europe. France did not invent nationalism, but the French Revolution intensified it. The destruction of inequality and the need to rally citizens around the new government of course encouraged nationalism in the French themselves. But just as important, the French conquest encouraged nationalism among the peoples conquered. This was especially true in the German states of Central Europe. One of the most predominant German philosopher, Johann Gottlieb Fritsch, published Addresses to the German Nation in 1808. He called on Germans to be proud as Germans and to recognize the German idea of being Bildung, inner ethnical cultural formation that was evident in German arts, letters, and philosophy. Germany, he believed, was unique in its egalitarianism, its concern for educating the whole person and its spirituality versus the abstract, intellectual, materialistic, mechanistic realism of the Enlightenment French, English, and Dutch. Fitch had been influenced by Johann Gottfried von Herder, also a contemporary of Kant, who had argued that every culture is a particular is a partial reflection of the Lordy of God and only all together do they reflect God as a whole. That was one of the earliest expressions of the ro romantic celebration of diversity and difference against cosmopolitanism, the notion that we are or out that we are our the in the notion that we are or ought to act like world citizens. Following Herder, Fitch claimed that a nation is a totality that arises together out of a certain special law of divine development. Each people develops with its own quality, reflecting on an aspect of divinity, and is a mirror of divinity, thereby developing its worth, merit, virtue. This leads to endless inner progress of spiritual communal formation, but mixing of culture leads to friction, flatness, separation from one's spiritual nature, and uniform and conjoining destruction. 
Fisch believed that Germany was a nation that would be a torrent of others' uniqueness. The state is merely a means to rebirth. The method is not political or military, but educational, requiring a truly German education of the whole person. Germany must resist Napoleon through the methods of education and cultural formation. Each German state must develop its own method towards this end. Varieties of nationalism. A nation can be defined in different ways. There can be civic nationalism as opposed to ethnic or racial nationalism, and there can be aggressive forms of nationalism as opposed to merely republican or liberal self-ruling forms of nationalism. The dividing line between types of national nationalist states rests on two issues, how they define their people and how they de tre treat those who don't satisfy the criteria. The Nazis, for example, use racial criteria and kill people for not fulfilling them. Others use ethnic criteria, such as a shared history, language, or cultural tradition. In today's France, membership rests on French language and knowledge of the Republican and cultural history of France. Today's United States, an immigrant society, arguably has a, an even thinner or more minimal notion of its people, a civic identity that is not tied to a language or a cultural history, but rather a shared set of civic ideals. During nationalism increasingly became allied to liberal republicanism during the 19th century. By the time of the Treaty of Versace, Woodrow Wilson, a progressive, championed nationalism against the power of the great European empires. Remember, nationalism means that the people should rule themselves. It was, it was only fascism and Nazism in the middle of the 20th century that made nationalism seem anti-liberal and anti-democratic. This all touches on the philosophical question that will be raised later by multiculturalism. They respect different people from their differences, including their right to govern themselves, also means respecting the right to stay different, which will likely mean restricting the rights of some members to maintain their distinctiveness. The more interaction of individuals across groups, the more those individuals are treated as free, cosmopolitan individuals, and the more, as Fitch says, friction will wear away and flatten group differences. Changing Nature of Warfare Warfare has always had customary rules among given peoples concerning when opponents may fight, who may fight, and how they may fight. Pre-modern warfare was often highly stylized and restrained. This doesn't mean it wasn't bloody, especially when ethnically and culturally different peoples were involved, but throughout medieval times, warriors had to buy and own their own equipment, which meant that not many could be warriors. Standing armies were unusual because they were expensive. In Asian republics, there was a strong tradition that the citizen was also a soldier. Ancient republicanism was martial. In medieval feudalism, a similar system was in place in that landowners were warriors and nobody else was a citizen at all. The king would call on people to fulfill their feudal ob obligations and reward them. Again, wars were limited and controlled by rules and chivalry which did not apply to commoners. Fighting between fellow aristocrats was an affair of honor but treatment of non-Christians, as in the Crusades, was often unregulated, and treatment of Christian presence depended on circumstances. This was particularly true in sieges of towns, which were, which were by definition full of commoners. If a town refused to surrender to a noble, the town was besieged, and if the siege was successful, all property and lives were considered forfeit. The early modern period was predominantly realist regarding the morality of war. It held that warfare is a reality in the relations among political communities and leaders and that the civil standard of morality cannot be applied to warfare. In the early modern period, this was called raison d'etat, reason of state, meaning that the reasons requiring bloodshed cannot be subject to civic moral standards. The French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars changed warfare forever. The French army, which eventually had to fight most of the Europe, had to employ conscription, coupled with France's new democracy and but in nationalism, this became the first mass people's army, a vast mobilization of an average citizen to fight for France. Not for a class, for nobles, or for king. It was the largest army in history, dramatically increasing the capacity to wage war. Karl von Clausewitz. The transformation of warfare was reflected in perhaps the first modern European work on military theory that could be called philosophical, on war, 1832, written by the Prussian officer Karl von Clausewitz. Clausewitz defined a real or empirical war as the continuation of policy by other means. Distinguished from pure or ideal war, defined as an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will, pure war involves only the military aspects of war, such as the troop deployments, 
terrain, methods, and so on. These must be analyzed and conceived separate from political consideration, which can change and muddy military analysis. Clausewitz recognizes that real war is political, which means that both the end and the practice of war are constantly authored by the political considerations. His point was to distinguish war proper from the realities warfare serves and cannot escape, but he also had a historically point to make. The implication is that modern war, war starting with Napoleon and the new armies of nation states, will tend more to a pure, pure war because the, r the resources of modern state will outstrip all earlier considerations. Wars will be more pure, less ritualized, more violent, and less restricted by secondary political considerations. Clausewitz saw the modern nation state was dis dis destined to become an entity in which human equality and democracy would flourish, but it would also put more resources in the hands of a now national military, making the modern state the most dangerous entity in human history. Well, guys, I hope you liked this video. Remember to hit like and share from the traditional channel. Hope to see you guys again.